Because if it's organic and it's actually people that are uh, hungry and that is needing food, that's a different kind of story. But I don't think that that's the way that it's going to be. It's going to be uh, a planned um, event, right? And they're going to pay people to go out and um, disrupt these people's food and, and the farmers and stuff so that they could bring in the military uh, to, uh, to guard the crops and to guard people's food. That There's no way in anybody's right mind that you would let the military occupy your farmland across the nation unless the flash mobs were targeting farms and then the army would be in some people's opinion, a welcome relief from having to do like Wild West style. Everybody put perimeters up of all the neighbors doing watch on radios and stuff. And good afternoon, everyone. Guess who I have back? Ryder Lee. Mm -hmm. So much positive feedback. Raised by Giants. Remember, you enjoyed the interview so much. The comments were just outrageous. Far more comments on those uh, videos than almost every other video that I'd done, except maybe a David Morgan video. But the things were real that we were talking about. They were very timely. And, you know, you've seen a giant uptick in, in things happening at the moment here. So, Ryder, appreciate you coming back on. Uh, we just have about an hour today to go through a few items. And, you know, we were trying to connect some dots chatting back and forth, trying to get this time set up here. So what do you see moving forward? Or what do you see, I guess, the narrative or the next moves, the next chess pieces being moved around? What, what do we envision for the next year here? I have from May and then to the end of the year kind of sussed out in terms of months and, and quarters that things will change. But what are you thinking now? Well, thank you so much for having me back on, David. I shaved my beard off, so hopefully people <laughs> still recognize me. But um, yes, thank you so much for uh, inviting me back on. Um, really fascinating times that we live in right now. You know, food prices at an all-time high, crop yields down, gas prices up, supply chain disruptions inbound. It's incredible. So I think that we're going to have a really good conversation, even though that it's going to be kind of short. But I think that the first thing, <laughs> it's amazing that people thought that we could shut down the world for two years and put everybody on unemployment, you know, close small businesses and everything would just go on as normal, right? With no disruptions to the economy or food uh, disruption or hyperinflation. It's really, really fascinating, David, like who could have seen all of this coming? You know, and as you know, every action we take gets an equal and opposite reaction, right? And we haven't even begun to feel the repercussions of our actions from the past two years. And based off of the past and past actions from governments, uh, leaders, politicians, uh, influential groups, it's not going to get any better that I can see. Such a hopeful message to begin the broadcast with. Thanks, Ryder. You just set up my day. <laughs> I mean, it's really all about scarcity, right? If you can manufacture a shortage, which they are, it's, and it's not for the lack of not having the food yet. The, the farmers are abundant. As you know, it's, it's the disruption of the food that's the problem right now. It's not... It's not the food not making it. It's about the food not making it to the market. So it's any way that you look at it, it's manufactured. And, it, and it's, it's getting like that everywhere now. It, it, and it used to just be like parts of the country that were kind of experiencing shortages, you know, with bare shelves, no product. But now it's everywhere, right? And I'm sure some of that could be attributed by some people that we just got through the holiday season, you know, but... I think that that's just accelerated it and they're using that as an excuse because I don't remember after a holiday season before um, every single store in my area having empty shelves, right? Maybe a few, but again, not every single one. So something more is going on. If you push people to the food shortage, because you see the, the restrictions being lifted across the world right now suddenly because they see the citizens taking action against the mandates. 
so in unison the entire planet suddenly lift them as quickly as they implemented them now then you could say oh the people won look but then what's behind that the next thing is going to be the food shortages now will it be the shortage where we're going to be crawling on the the ground with our bellies you know bloated because we haven't had enough food and that's the last step before starvation so okay. the fertilizer coming in mm -hmm. is going to be a one percent loss to a one percent decline in yield now, there's been a a new bevy of articles out and the one that's making waves now there's a zero hedge article saying that the uh the food supply shortage is going to be far 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 should i say it again far greater than anybody anticipates so just the current state of affairs here the fertilizer price is running about four times higher than it was last year. Got a few messages. I talk to some people in the ag business and farms that are over a thousand acres generally buy a little bit ahead. So they know they're going to be pre-preparing the fields, the time they're going to plant. So they try to get everything ready because, you know, putting fertilizer at a uniform will spread over a thousand acres, but that's the smallest. Sometimes there are 10,000 acres. 25,000 acres. I mean, you, you got to have everything in a row and completely uh, everything in bins. And, you know, you, you, it's a it's a full working operation. So they're always forward buying and they're always full. So they know when they need to plant and um, harvest and apply the, the different herbicides, whatever, during planting. Well, that's for anybody with over a thousand acres or, you know, 10,000, whatnot. So a lot of people that do farming or they're down on the 100 acre, 200 acre, 50 acre, 20 acre plots. And that's a huge amount of, you know, rural America. It's hard to find, at least here in East Tennessee down here, you know, there are some thousand acre, 5,000 acre farms, but those are rare. Those are like super old money, super old generations, first settler kind back in here. Most people are running about hundred acres at the moment or less. So those are not gonna be getting the fertilizer. And then what is also happening in conjunction with this, and I'm making a bold call here, we're going to have a corn shortage because the herbicides that are needed when you plant corn is to alleviate and like remove grass out of the rows in between the corn. And corn takes a lot more fertilizer. They call it heavy feeding. And it takes a lot of herbicides there to keep because grasses are tenacious. Yeah, so flat leaf plants, you know, those are pretty easy to kill. You look at those dandelions and, you know, broad leaves, things that have a much bigger leaf on them. Uh, amaranth would be another one, nettles, these kind of things. Those are edibles for us, right? But for a farmer, those are weeds in the middle of the field. But grasses, whew, they're rough to kill and they get the weeds and the roots go down deep. So they're competing for the same nutrients that are being applied in the fields. So there's going to be a decline on the yields because they don't have enough uh, inputs in there to knock out the weeds. So the weeds are going to compete with the same nutrients. So the kernel size won't be as large. The bean size won't be as large. And there's a few things going on uh, beyond that. So the fertilizer shortages are huge. Yeah, there's an article that I read that um, said the two shortages that threaten the absolute uh, eviscerate the global economy in 2022. And one of those things was uh, food shortages due to fertilizer prices. And another thing was uh, car manufacturers. Right. And and not being able to produce the amount of chips that go into the cars and you in order for them to go to the market. Right. And, and this is what happens. I mean, what happens is exactly what you're talking about. Right. What happens when the farmers get hit, too? Right. <clears throat> what happens when soil and grain get so expensive that they can't afford it? Right. And it was already hit really hard to find seeds and grain at the beginning of 2021. So what happens when they can't afford it anymore or a big natural disaster happens and wipes out large portions of lands and crops, you know, affecting uh, global uh, crop yields like in uh, Madagascar with the cyclone wiping out the um, vanilla bean production and the Tonga volcano eruption that we have no idea what's going what that's going to do and the impact of that in the 2022 harvest and beyond. And this moment that I'm talking about is vastly approaching, you know, like you're talking about with soil and uh, grain being at an all time high and, it, and eventually, uh, you know, seeds basically being non existent anymore. 
you know, especially organic seeds. Like you can't find those bad boys anywhere. I mean, True Leaf Market was even out of pretty much everything uh, at the beginning of 2021. And and you can't forget about, uh, you can definitely forget about trying to uh, find or buy heirloom seeds when things really go down. Not going to happen, right? We're seeing a steady... Uh, you know, a, a big pickup of, you know, natural disasters too, right? Like what I like to call in natural disasters, because they're anything but natural. They've been using weather modification technology, uh, geoengineering for decades now, cloud seeding technology. I mean, look up in the sky, right? Does, does anything about it, uh, you know, look natural? Today's all blue, you know, and you're right. I, I, you know, you go from a completely blue sky and then you start seeing, seeing the, the lines up there. And see, that's one of the, the things I talked about for years was, okay, geoengineering ongoing, Harvard's doing it, uh, Cambridge has their program, NASA's delving into it. They're looking at the different types of particulates to put up from the metal to the calcium carbonate. There's just an enormous amount of things that are being tested on this to, you know, put a layer of sun bouncing medium up there. But then, you know, like this Tonga eruption, it went up to 180,000 foot in the center column. And then you have the, yeah. the particles up there, plus all the new ash. So if maybe it would have come out naturally. And there's a, there's a dispersion rate of, I think it's about three years. So when it's dispersed up there, the finest of the particles after about three years will make their way to the ground. But now you're adding in all this extra ash and sulfur dioxide. Will that be three years or will it be an exponential runaway thing? Because, you know, I want to go back to the corn because this is the most important thing. Like, I really cannot get it across right here. This is the, the beginning of the de-evolution of society when we, when we have corn shortage. Because corn's used for everything. Mainly the animal fodder. Okay, then if, if we go the knock on, then we're talking about beef prices, dairy prices. But then what about ethanol? There's an enormous amount mandated into the fuel supply. So that's going to be a disruption in the fuel supply because we already have the pipelines cut up. So we can't go back to 100% like we used to have. Remember, for, for those of you who are not that old, we never used to have ethanol in the, uh, in, in the petrol at all. It used to be 100% petrol. There was no additives into it that are you know, causing more friction and damage in your engine. There's E85 stuff, unless your car is rated for it. The old guys here, back in the 1930s and 40s, used to distill their own alcohol to run in their engines. Right. And then they made that illegal moonshiners, whatever. It wasn't about moonshining and drinking. It was about fuel production with no tax paid. So, again, you can go back to reefer madness with that whole thing with all the different uh, usables that are inside the hemp plant competing directly with the industry. But at the same time, the distillers out here, they were doing massive, you know, just runs and runs, gall 55 gallons, you know, every several hours were coming out of some of these stills. They were their own fuel production companies using corn out here, corn mash, moonshine, but they demonized it as moonshine. Everyone is getting moonshine with the jug. No, it was about, they made their own fuels without paying tax. So, you know, everybody apparently was doing this around the countryside. So the oil companies trying to get their fingers in at a single distribution point through that nozzle, they can tax and charge. They had to, again, get big government involved to then do the whole thing and, uh, you know, get different groups like, NGOs of the 1920s saying our husbands drink too much. We need to outlaw alcohol. Then the prohibition, and that was really it. The prohibition was really the thing with the corn that stopped people from making their own fuels in the countryside. Now, with that said, today's corn is used in an enormous amount of food products. Like there's almost nothing that's not corn based, especially if you go to a supermarket. So the farmers are switching over to soybeans, which is going to be a problem for them because, you know, there's going to be a Himalaya size mountain of soybeans laying around, a coffee cup full of corn to supply the nation. Farmers are going to get priced out because they're going to be a glut of soy. But then on the corn side, oh my, we're not going to have enough. And where are you going to import that from? Because I'm going to say one last thing, right? You hit it on the head. Tonga eruption is going to cool the Southern hemisphere and reduce their crop yields. I've done extensive videos, at least a 40 minute video compilation on this. Argentina, South Africa. These two are going to be the most heavily affected because they're in the mid-grow season. Now that's for this year because they're in the mid-grow. They're not at harvest, they're past plant. Plants are trying to uptake and grow, but then they're going to get covered with acid rain. And precipitation patterns are shifting, light not as much, a little bit cooler temperature is going to be about say one degree Celsius. So just like, you know, let's say one and a half degree Fahrenheit, cooler average temperature. 
That'll also pinch in on the grow times. So I did this whole analysis of which countries are in mid grow at the, at this time and which ones are into harvest and which ones hadn't planted yet. So the biggest wild card, Argentina, Argentina. I mean, they're major, 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 major suppliers of corn and they even were withholding their corn exports because they were having a corn shortage. So anybody who thinks like Brazil and Argentina are just going to supply all this corn that magically disappears because we don't have the fertilizers everything's going to be affected by this lack of corn production. And then that all stems back to not having enough herbicides to control the grass in the rows. And then the amount of fertilizer that corn uptakes being so great compared to other crops. Like we've pinched ourselves into a corner on reliance on a single thing. We're pinched in a corner on reliance on oil. Now we're pinched in a corner on reliance on corn. And both of those seem to be disappearing in front of us. So I don't know. It is manufactured, in my opinion. I, th I think you're absolutely right. Yeah, and you're you're definitely right about uh, we, that we could be seeing acid rain, you know. And then what kind of sunlight are the crops getting uh, by the sun being blocked out from the ash? And when you get less yields, where are those countries going to get their product from? You know, they're, it's going to not. have to be. This going to have to be. Uh, well, if they are, it's going to have to be imported, right? And then that puts more strain on the countries that are already experiencing shortages and then you're in a bidding war at that point if it's even available and you know the misnomer is yeah i can just import it and buy it from another country well the world's scrambling right now is china's buying half of everything on the open global market so china will pay anything for the food now it, fe it feels for me they just closed their third port now and there's a fourth port they even closed shenzhen ningbo shanghai just in the last week so it seems like they're walling themselves off the stuff keeps coming in Imports keep coming in, rolling in on the food shipments, but everything outbound has kind of ceased across the East Coast. Super drip feed of the exports coming out of China on a boat. Seems like they're walling themselves off and they're really willing to pay anything over market price. So then when you come to these, you know, more impoverished nations or ones that, you know, are uh, not superpower economies that really rely on using other people's money, like using the dollar as their currency because their currencies are so uh instable or not valued across the planet so they have to alternatively uptake another currency to pay for their imports dollars these countries are not going to get the food they need they're already talking about a 30 million ton this is this is if supply chains continue to function perfectly a 30 million ton deficit decline non-available not grown harvest yield declines in africa this year because of not enough fertilizer 30 million tons. Where are you going to make that up? You just don't because every country is going to experience the same thing of a decline. And the Southern Hemisphere countries are going to experience declines from the fertilizers and also declines from the acid rain and the ash from the Tonga eruption. Like it's dovetailing into something really we haven't seen in multi um, more than 400 years or maybe even thousands, plural of years now with the amount of things that are limiting food production and food availability for a populace. And then they're going to revolt. And then what? So you already filled in that piece there. There's already another plan, which I'd like to hear. Cause you know, people are going to go to the streets when they get hungry. It always happens. So then what? Yeah. And then we have the, you know, the, the trucker uh, strike in, uh, in Canada, that's been, you know, joined by a bunch of U S truckers. And, you know, I can't help but to think, in my logical mind, based off of the past and, um, you know, governments, uh, that it's a, that it's a bogus banner. There's a lot of common misconceptions about bogus banners, because when people hear that word, they think in their mind that the event isn't real, right? But in reality, it's very real, though it's just a staged event to make us believe it happened organically in order to push people in a desired direction, right? These events are made to look like it came from a certain country, race, group, or rogue individuals when it's really the opposite, right? It's a large scale planned event uh, with an objective. And it's most commonly used for uh, events to perpetuate war. But in this case, I believe 
it's a manufactured uh, food shortage, right? And and we've become so desensitized to this because the building blocks are stacked so far in advance to gauge the public's reaction to freely accept the agenda as a problem reaction solution. And the groundwork is laid out years before, right? Using um, entertainment like movies, TVs, video games, social media, where thoughts and ideas are planted like seeds, right? In our subconscious mind, trickling down into our daily lives to train our minds uh, to, to see what's what's going to happen so the event largely goes off without a hitch and it's all designed to get you on board with an agenda while tricking you into believe that you're doing something for the betterment of society the 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 bogus banner events have been taking to such great lengths david pulling on the heartstrings of people using their emotions against us you know nothing is off limits to these orchestrators right? Whatever it takes to see the agenda through and the best way to get us to react and be subservient is to make us think that it's our idea. The media comes in flooding the airways with the desired outcome. Anything can be painted in a positive or a negative light through the mainstream media, through manipulation. And if the media doesn't want you to see something, then they're not going to show it. They won't air it. The bogus banner programs are so sophisticated and well orchestrated that the majority will never know they're being used and are actively participating in a bogus banner event because it's painted in such a way for the betterment of society that everyone can get behind it and support it. You know, the, the flash mobbing that's been occurring across the U.S., you know, again, I would point into one of these things. Flash mobs. Uh, finally, the police are taking action, but it's, it's set in there, the seed, everybody understands what a flash mob is. They all understand the lexicon. They know what it does. It rolls in it like a locust and then, drrr, and then takes everything and runs away. As these food shortages increase and there'll be people on the streets, food prices will be too high and availability. Uh, mm-hmm. there'll be just craziness in the stores, but the first thing they'll do is they'll put troops in the stores and a military and a police to control. Now that'll work for a little while, but then it'll get out of control at the end of the year. Now when the harvest, there'll be some timelines with this. So the the great awakening of like the mama bear of the family and just general person understanding this will be May, June. It'll be making all the headlines. Like we're not gonna have a fertilizer and then people, and then the news is gonna run with the shortages to cause more shortages because they're gonna create the false shortages by putting in the news that there's so much shortages encouraging people to encouraging people to run out and even buy more self-fulfilling feedback loop on that, which they want to push. They need it to happen. They have to have the food runs on the stores because that in turn will be the, the catalyst for then the flash mobs out in the countryside running in pillaging, you know, they might come in with, let's say 10 SUVs and 40 people and they'll strip a farm or they'll strip a field or they'll strip an orchard or they'll pillage a warehouse or they do something just like they're doing with the five star goods and, you know, handbags and jewelry and whatever it is now that will be the catalyst for them. And I'm saying it and, you know, there's no way in anybody's right mind that you would let the military occupy your farmland across the nation. Unless the flash mobs were targeting farms and then the army would be in some people's opinion, a welcome relief from having to do like Wild West style, everybody put perimeters up of all the neighbors doing watch on radios and stuff around. You know, temporary housing is quite easy to construct. So it'll be fed to us as army needs to be out on the farms to protect it because there's so many flash mobs. And now the point where the local police and the local farmers and communities can't protect themselves anymore. So we need to station troops out in the farming country which would be a no-no. That would be called an invasion before. And there would be people behind every, every tree, every blade of grass, there would be somebody behind it. The, but if you can switch it a little bit and everything's been in play already, you can see how it's unfolding. So whole army out into the countryside, they wouldn't put them out here in the winter. That would do no good. There's nothing out here to steal in the winter except the warehouses. So 
If May and June, you see the awareness of mama bear and the general populace understanding food shortages are here. The harvest time is when they would start putting military out all across the countryside in all the farming communities across the US. But then at what point do they get a call one day, quit protecting, go look for all these people. That's the only way I can see it done. And that will have to be occurring around August or September, just before. So the flash mobs will be rolling in right around when things are maturing in the fields. So each of our latitudes is gonna have a different maturation date. So if this is going to occur, you would start to see uh, military movements and maybe people welcoming them into more northerly latitude grow belts, Indiana, Ohio, um, Vermont, Maine, Massachusetts, Montana, you know, I mean, how would you get military into Montana in the farm fields? No way right now. That's like a bastion. But if it's a, a different presented in a different way. Minnesota, Idaho, you know, these old northern latitudes. And then it'll slowly drift south. They're going to follow the harvest. Well, then the next month when you get in and then especially right around like late September, early October. You know, if the flash mobs are running wild out on the farms, when everything's here, everything's stock packed, it's in boxes, it's ready to ship for harvest. What if somebody comes rolling in with their 18 wheelers in a convoy of like 400 armed people and strip something out with several 18 wheelers? You know, this is where the point will be where they're going to demand military stay out in the farming communities to protect the food because there'll already be such a food shortage that they'll be demand that to get out here and protect the food, the food supply, the food distribution points, the warehouses, and even the farms themselves. We saw this in 2008 over in Thailand. They were getting their rice fields stripped at night. People would drive in and, you know, go in with the harvesting machines after their rice fields were um, fully matured and then strip multiple acres in the evening and just drive off with it. You know, then they had to have, then they did have to put military out there as patrols to stop these nighttime marauders. I'm just learning from the past. I'm simply looking at what happened eight or 10 years ago in Thailand, 12 actually. So think about that. Could it occur again here? Of course it could. So uh, this is, I think the plan. So those are the two main dates, May, June, and then coming into the harvest season, uh, September, October. So those are gonna be two pivots for what you're mentioning society and uh, also the way things are uh, coalescing food pricing, uh, not available, uh, people's reactions, because you know they're gonna react a certain way. They've already gamed this a million times. Food shortages create this type of reaction every single time. So then it's already planned for. Yeah, they have contingencies for every single thing that happens. But my thoughts are, is the flash mobs going to be organic uh, no. people no. or is it gonna be staged and planned, right? Okay, um, a little of both maybe. Because if it's organic and it's actually people that are uh, hungry and that is needing food, that's a different kind of story. But I don't think that that's the way that it's going to be. It's going to be uh, a planned um, event, right? And they're going to pay people to go out and um, disrupt these people's food and, and the farmers and stuff so that they could bring in the military. Uh, to uh, to guard the crops and to guard people's food. That, that's the way that I see it because I, I really don't, it would take a lot. It would take a lot for people to get to that point. And it would have to be a very, very slow process, right? It's, it's going to take a lot of time and uh, to get people to organically go and steal people's um, food and steal their crops in the United States uh, because we're good people here, right? We, we, we have good hearts and we normally have each other's back. So I feel like the only way that that's really going to happen here is if we are at the lowest point that we could possibly be, right? Where we are completely starving, we have nothing and we're hungry. Yeah.